Here we go. Okay, um, happy uh, Wednesday, everybody. For those that are calling in, I think everyone here it is Wednesday. Um, my name is Caitlin Thaney. I'm the Executive Director of Invest in Open Infrastructure. And this is our first community conversation around technical resilience in open infrastructure. Um, this, um, we are pleased to be joined by three of our kind of top community members and also um, you know, friends of Invest in Open Infrastructure, individuals who are leading work in this space and will be uh, able to provide some really interesting lenses to kind of talk through the idea of interoperability and technical resilience on this call. Um, this conversation is the first in a series following our um, years long work around the future of open scholarship, which I'll provide sort of links out to you following this. Um, and that project brought together over 115 different participants from different organizations, research institutions, libraries, infrastructure providers um, around the world uh, to look at areas of collective action and opportunity, identifying points that could be leveraged and also different means of sustaining and supporting um, the future of open scholarly infrastructure. The, there were a number of key themes that have come out of that work, which we are in the process of um, finalizing the write-ups for that, which will be shared out shortly. Um, this is uh, one of our kind of themed conversations, which we'll be having a number of these over the coming months, digging into some of those leading findings. Um, we start intentionally with looking at technical resilience and interoperability um, from a systems level, uh, because I think that it is one of the most important areas that we saw you know, some real, some, some real strain on, and especially over the past year. Um, and so, you know, some of the key items that have come out in our work from conversations with practitioners and also infra infrastructure providers and funders over the past year was really a call for aligning our systems and how we view uh, shared open infrastructure needs, combating some of the areas where there might be some inefficiencies or, you know, sort of misaligned priorities that are keeping us from achieving this aim of, you know, more sustainable infrastructure. So I will share some more about some of the work that we're doing to help move that forward and some ways you can get involved at the end of this, um, end of this conversation, um, but also want to really hand this over to our speakers here to have a dialogue about some of these uh, key areas. So we will, you know, have a, a kind of conversation there and there will also be a place for some questions and answer uh, section at the end of it. So please feel free to add your questions to the chat and we will make sure that we've got some time for those. Okay. So without further ado, um, I would love for each of our speakers to unmute and introduce themselves and also their projects. And then we will hop right in. So Alec, you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. It's good to see so many familiar faces. Uh, I am here from the west coast of Canada um, with the Public Knowledge Project, and I'm the Associate Director of Development with them, um, which essentially means that I came on to this project about 15 years ago as a developer and have, as many do, kind of graduated from there into more and more kind of community and team management, that sort of thing. But I still do write a lot of code. And um, our best known project is Open Journal Systems. Um, which was the first project that PKP put out. Uh, PKP was founded in 1998 by John Walensky. And the goal of the project was to improve the scholarly and public quality of research. And a lot of that's to do with um, the early days of open access and uh, the tools to reduce cost in order to give control of publishing back to the scholars through automation and time saving and that sort of thing. Um, Open Journal Systems is, again, our best known piece of software. It's used by somewhere over 15,000 publications in the world, uh, active publications, that is. Um, it's really hard for us to measure because uh, we are an open source group and we don't require any kind of registration. There's no centralized service. And so people take the software and run with it. And they come back to us occasionally with some really interesting projects that we never would have imagined. We also do um, a few other things, Open Monograph Press for monograph publishing and Open Preprint Systems for preprint publishing. We have a preservation network for uh, long-term preservation of content using locks. Uh, we have a research arm because we are based out of an academic institution. So we're kind of active on a, a lot of different things. Um, a couple of things that might distinguish us, uh, we're not unique in this, but we are open source first. And uh, that's distinguished from many projects that kind of say they're open source. They'll use GitHub, for example, to um, store some sort of a free 
uh, form of the software in the same way you might store your winter tires in a storeroom <laughs> in the summertime, but they don't actually, it's kind of a freemium type model where they actually would primarily host and provide services on a fee for service model, but then provide some kind of an open source equivalent as kind of a, a freemium step towards um, engaging with the centralized model. We are quite decentralized with all of the joys that that um, entails, which I'm sure we'll get into fairly shortly. Um, on funding, I'm sure we'll get towards funding. Uh, PKP, just in brief, has three kind of sources for funding. Uh, one is fee for service. So we do offer publishing services and folks will host with us uh, for their journals or monographs or, or whatever. Um, that's, we'd originally had a third, third, third model for funding, but actually the hosting does provide more than its fair share of a third of our funds. Um, we have a membership model. And so folks who uh, want to support our work will kick in uh, so much per year on uh, one, two, three year kind of bases. Uh, and we're doing that kind of thing as well with, uh, with SCOS, for example, um, which is uh, a bit of an experiment for us. And then we also have, um, we're based in Canada. So we have some grants from the Canadian federal government, for example, that do provide for generally new features, but actually we're lucky to have one that does maintenance, which is a, a big challenge for, for infrastructure projects like ours. Uh, maybe I'll just leave it there for now with lest I go on for the whole hour. Thanks, Alec. Chris, I'd love to hear more about you and 2i2c. Yeah, it's nice to meet everybody. Um, I so, so in case said we should talk about our projects, that's like, a, that can mean a lot of different things for me. So what I'll do is kind of give a smattering of things that I've been working on for the last couple of, of years and then focus it on 2i2c, which is our the main source of our efforts now. Um, so I've been working with a, a really large open source community called the Jupyter Project for many years now. Um, Jupyter builds tools and interactive or tools and protocols and standards around interactive computing in general. Um, and that actually means quite a lot of things. The, the most well-known thing that people use in the Jupyter community is called the Jupyter Notebook, which is a combination of a user interface and a document uh, format and standard around sort of packaging narrative content and, and computational content into a single linear document. Um, Jupyter notebooks have become quite popular and they, they are used across many different parts of, of um, you know, both industry and academia, which is an interesting um, nuance to, to maybe talk about later. Um, I also work a lot on sort of satellite projects, no pun intended, of, uh, of the Jupyter notebook. So Jupyter Hub provides a way to centralize um, infrastructure and provide access to that centralized infrastructure via you know, web interfaces or whatever, so that a single person can maintain an environment and maybe some you know, complex connections to computational resources or data or whatever, and users can just access it remotely rather than having to install it all on their own machines. Um, I also work a lot on a project called Binder, which uh, allows people to share computational reproducible environments with other people um, from repositories that are stored you know, on GitHub or Zenodo or GitLab or whatever. Um, and then I also work on a project called Jupyter Book, which is a way of sharing collections of Jupyter notebooks and other computational content in a more traditional kind of like book-like structure with cross-references and citations and, and things like that. Um, one of the, so, so on the kind of like uh, actual career job side, I've been working at UC Berkeley for the last four or five years. Um, and a lot of what I've been doing there is basically acting or existing at the intersection of this tools and ecosystem around interactive computing in Jupyter and the use cases that were at, at UC Berkeley around um, you know, research and, and educational use cases there. So as one example of that, um, we run this really, really large Jupyter hub for an introductory data science course on campus um, that they call the data hub. Um, and the course is, it's really generic. It's meant to be for like anybody who's interested in, in data science and, and not for people that just want to go into it, but for people who want to go into, you know, literature, or economics or whatever, but they just want to start with some kind of data-driven principles and, and thinking. And the Jupyter Hub provides a sort of shared common space that minimizes the activation barrier to, to engaging with that material. Um, and that allows people to, to learn much more efficiently and quickly, particularly if they're not familiar with, you know, data science and programming and that kind of thing. And we've also worked with a lot of research communities who use this similar kind of structure to provide access to like cloud data, cloud infrastructure, scalable computing, that, that kind of thing. So that kind of brings me to 2i2c. Um, basically, over the last couple of years, um, there have been two different challenges that we've run into in both of the two spheres that I've just mentioned. 
on the Jupiter side, um, as I'm sure many people here appreciate, uh, just because a project is well used does not mean that it's well supported. And Jupiter has had sort of constant challenges in trying to continually get funding for people to maintain the software, to build new things, that kind of thing. And an interesting second nuance there is that as Jupiter has become more and more and more used outside of the research community, um, I mean, it's now used in pretty much every single major tech company. Lots of tech companies have products that are based off of Jupiter um, tools. As that has grown, as that piece of Jupiter has grown, I think that the relative representation from the scholarly community has, has kind of consistently declined in the Jupiter world. Like we've, you know, representation and governance in terms of who's working on the project on a daily basis has shifted more towards people working in, in industry and less people that are embedded within academic groups or educational groups or whatever. And that's not like inherently a problem. You want to have like a big diverse group of people, but but I think that it is important that we have representation in these like large marquee projects from communities that are aligned with the interests of the scholarly community. The other thing that we ran into was that um, we basically spoke to a lot of people who would say, how can we do the same thing that like Berkeley is doing around the data hub or that like the Pangeo project is doing around scalable cloud access via Jupyter hubs and this sort of modular tools. And we tried to help them kind of via writing tutorials, running workshops, whatever, um, adopt the same workflows. And ultimately, I think that we concluded that it's just, you know, running cloud infrastructure is just fundamentally hard. It takes resources and skills, and that is a particularly inaccessible skill set for many people who are in um, academic institutions, particularly under-resourced ones, you know, like community colleges and things like that. And so that led us to try a, a new experiment, which is to create an open source organization. It's called the International Interactive Computing Collaboration, or 2I2C. Um, the goal of that organization is to try to address, in a sense, both of the challenges that I just mentioned. So it will do a combination of its own focused research and development around interactive computing, um, at least initially with like a focus on the Jupyter ecosystem. It'll also run services, so a combination of you know, managed cloud services for particular use cases in research, like scalable computing with Dask on you know, Google Cloud to provide access to a 10 terabyte data set, that kind of stuff, um, or educational use cases. Um, and basically, we're just now getting started. So the, the organization has only been in existence for about four or five uh, months, although we've been sort of kicking around these ideas for many years. And so we're kicking, we're, we're, we're kind of grinding through a lot of really interesting questions around governance and stakeholders and, and you know, what does it mean to have an organization that is dedicated towards principles and values of the scholarly community, um, but that is in many ways acting like, you know, another vendor in an ecosystem that is extremely saturated. You know, there are like 7,000 notebook startup as a service organizations. Um, and so I think probably there are some interesting questions there that, that maybe we can dig into later, but um, I'll just stop there and, and give that as like a general overview of where we're at right now. Thanks, Chris. Oh, there's so many things I want to dig into afterwards, but first, Martin. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm Martin Eve. I'm Professor of Literature, Technology and Publishing at Birkbeck, which is one of the constituent colleges of the University of London. Um, when I'm not doing my job in an English literature department, I run a project called the Open Library of Humanities, which is an open access publisher in the humanities disciplines. It's funded by uh, a collective model by about 303 libraries at the moment. Uh, who all put some money aside every year so that we can continue our operations. Um, I should say it's, it's great to be on the call with my fellow panelists today. I actually got into open access thanks to PKP and using open journal systems and realizing that there was something beyond the open of open source in the title there. That was actually what drew me to open access. Um, Perhaps ironically, though, we actually run our own journal system called Janeway, which is one of the primary reasons that I'm here today, which is a Python based, uh, Python Django based journal management framework. Um, it has a preprint server built in. We have various models of review, post publication, and pre publication there. Um, and really, I want to talk a little bit around the, the issues that have arisen for us in, in running that, in sustaining that, and in thinking about technical interop. And really, there are just four key points I was going to hit that I thought would probably resonate with my co-panelists and that would open us out into a broader discussion. And the first is that 
it seems to me there's no such thing as technical resilience if you don't have financial resilience in your organization. At the end of the day, although it sounds reductive and a kind of economic thinking, all problems are in some ways resource and economic problems um, that can be resolved if you have that stability. So in the first place, you know, when we talk about technical as though that's somehow separate from economic or social factors, I'm not sure that those aren't more embroiled with one another. Um, the second point I had was that it seems to me that technical choices uh, have economic and social consequences. People often like to use the word techno determinist in a pejorative way. They like us to think that actually there's agency outside of technical decisions and technical decisions should be in the service of agency. But choices of your programming language and framework affect, for instance, who you can hire and at what price point. They affect number of, and quality of people who will apply. And they affect things around what your community looks like, what kind of engineers, what kind of software people, what kind of community you can actually build. So I think when we talk about technological resilience, we need to think about the broader social consequences of our technological choices. I hope today we're going to be talking quite a bit about interoperability and what we see as important in terms of getting projects to work alongside one another. Um, certainly that is hugely important, I think, in the space of journal management systems. But at the moment, the financial setups that we've, we've put in place act as disincentives for uh, different platforms to, to produce interop with one another. What's the incentive to allow users to uh, exit your platform if that results in financial penalty and organizational close down? Now you could argue, you know, that's just tough. That's how, that's how markets work. People make their choices, they go where they want. But I wonder whether there are ways we could think through new structures for incentivizing interop and playing nicely um, beyond it just being something that customers want from us and making it a core part of what we do that doesn't lead to, to dire long-term consequences if you see a mass exodus. And lastly, um, you know, it was great that Alex drew attention to being open source first. We adopted the, the set exact same mantra that open source is a core part of what we do and we're not compromising on developing things in the open. But on the other hand, open source doesn't fix everything um, you know we we rely on like pkp a hosting model to sustain our software development efforts uh, but there's still appropriation by stakeholders who don't communicate back who will take your project and not not be part of the community and perhaps that's okay you know various licenses we're using permit that so legally of course it, it's fine but are there ways that we can build better communities that don't just rely on the mantra of open source and we don't just use open source as some kind of assurance to paying stakeholders that if we if we crash and burn, they can roll their own instance. So yeah, those are those are my kind of four opening salvos, and I'm sure that we'll have a productive conversation around those and and other issues today. Thank you so much. Um, and you've hit on a number of the number of the points that have come up in at least our sort of studies of this over the past year as well. And I know also in conversation with you three and other members of your organizations as well. Um, I want to kind of start with that point about um, the sort of open source first and also the you know building of healthy communities because I do think that the when we talk about the interoperability and I know Chris especially for 2i2c like in terms of that right to replicate I know this is also something that is um, kind of built into the DNA of public knowledge project I know Janeway has also thought deeply about this in terms of you know that balance in in where the openness um, can help bring together those interconnections and the healthiness of the communities while also empowering other users um, in various ways. So I'll open the floor to anyone who wants to kind of jump in and comment on that first. I mean, so I can just have a quick thought. I think that one of, for me, one of the guiding principles that I try to, to use in designing tools or designing communities and organizations is to assume that we're going to fail. Like assume that after a couple of years, we'll just cease to exist. And then the question is like, what's the legacy and what's the impact that you want to leave, assuming that you're not going to be around for that long? Um, just because, you know, statistically speaking, that's how most organizations work. 
And at least for us, I think that one of the one of the downstream consequences of that principle is that in some ways we're like 2I2C is trying to take a fairly extreme stance on that position and that we want to be the controllers of as little as humanly possible. Like we want to partner with other pieces in the Jupyter ecosystem and other open source communities. Um, but we don't want to be the ones that are like a, a sort of gatekeeper or on the critical path towards that technology being used. And I think that that's going to have some challenges from a sustainability standpoint, because we're basically asking ourselves to be commodities. Like we, we want it to be super easy for other people to deploy that infrastructure. But in a sense, I think that's OK, because the goal is to have an impact rather than to sustain an organization per se. Um, and so I think that, you know, in, in my mind, part of those issues around um, sustainability and financials and, and, and whatnot, it depends on like how you view your organization in relation to the ecosystem of organizations around it. Um, because, you know, if we cease to exist, Jupiter will continue growing and the tools, if they are built in such a way that they have that interoperability from day one and like true actual interoperability, not like if you spend three weeks learning this thing, then maybe you'll be able to make it work interoperability. Um, I think that that, that resilience in a sense can, can mean more than just the existence of a particular organization. You know, the resilience of a mission can go beyond just one organization. I think it's just worth thinking about that too. Maybe I'll jump in next. Um, Chris, what you're describing is, so my background is I came from software before I got into academic publishing and I'm still just a layman in academic publishing. I don't have a, an academic background in that. Um, and so my, my ideals coming into work with public knowledge project were from the free and open source software world. And some of the things you're, you're saying are, are kind of the tenets of the way that free and open source software works is that an organization can, can disappear and the software can continue to live. And that's part of the guarantee that something that's, you know, not got the normal kind of vendor relationships is a reliable piece of software because the license, because the, the, the free software can continue once the, the company goes bust. Um, and it's not it's not clear to me that that can be applied well to the academic world. And this is part of what I've learned in that process, which is um, if PKP, for example, was to disappear, it would not be okay for our community. Um, and part of that's because, um, you know, academic libraries are not in the business of writing software. And in fact, many, very few of our, our, our users are out there contributing to software as code. Uh, we have many, many strong contributors for things like translations. We've got very passionate users but we have to invest as an organization a lot of effort into, let's say, our documentation, our support forum, into uh, helping people through upgrades, all that kind of stuff. Because it's not like a, a tech-based project where the nature of, of your community is one that has tech resources. So we kind of view it as our responsibility to the community to invest that time and to help to build capacity. And, and longer term, in order for PKP to, I think, um, meet its goals, it wants to be a means for libraries to achieve some kind of a technological baseline for their skills. But um, if you look at things like OpenStack, if I go to a conference and speak to the folks behind OpenStack, for example, everyone there knows software and works with software and, and our environment's a bit different. Um, it's been a bit of a challenge for us to find ways to kind of build that, that resiliency and technological baseline um, in a way that doesn't uh, that's not viewed as kind of a nice to have or an optional. And so the, the challenge we always have is that um, folks who work with us are doing so because in their jobs, they're passionate, but there's often not institutional support from higher up. Um, and I do think that one of the repercussions of uh, the, the uh, pandemic might be that in the, uh, the afterward where everyone's looking to put their budgets back together, for example, some of the things that we depend upon are viewed as optional, whereas uh, let's just pick a, a favorite um, punching bag. Elsevier has a very good team on things like accessibility. And accessibility is very hard to resource as a soft resource. You have to hire people who are good at it and they've got to have the right resources to work on that. Um, Elsevier is going to continue having things like accessibility funded because they've got a lab and that's being paid for through library budgets that are very, very hard to cut. Whereas for groups like ours, if we have a membership that's kind of based on discretionary funding that persists on a you know, year by year basis, um, and that's free software that will continue to be free in perpetuity in the abstract. Uh, that's a much easier one to cut back on. So um, I always see a bit of a tension between 
uh, the free in the free to open source software world versus the free in the library world. And we're kind of negotiating that gap and trying to um, make it work on both sides. I mean, for me, this um, goes back to a kind of foundational document of thinking three principles of scholarly infrastructure, which is Cameron Nalen, Jeff Builder, and Jennifer Lynn's um, article on principles of open scholarly infrastructure. And one of the most contentious points they have in that document is the um, assertion that infrastructures exist for a specific purpose, and that purpose can be radically simplified or even rendered unnecessary by technological or social change. If it is possible, the organization and staff should have direct incentive to deliver on the mission and wind down, as in, you should plan if you're running open scholarly infrastructure for what it looks like if your mission is achieved, and you can disband what you're doing. I think I, I share a sense with Alec that a lot of what we end up doing day to day doesn't really have that end point you know what we know what the world we want looks like and it's one where there are open source infrastructures that are well supported and resourced and develop robust systems for scholarly communication in, in the worlds we're in but if we got there we'd still have activities that we'd need to do to support that on an ongoing basis i also think there's a there's a great cartoon that's been going around in recent months i can't remember if it's xkcd or not but it's um you know, it's, it's this enormous stack of projects that look enormously well funded and are solid and it's infrastructure everyone relies on and there's this tiny little bridge piece that looks really fragile and it says that one open source project maintained by a guy in nebraska or something like that and if we're going to talk about the technical robustness of our infrastructures everyone needs everyone in that chain needs the same kind of robustness and you know, we, we often get, say, GitHub alerts that a component you're relying on has a security vulnerability. We rely on the downstream provider to ensure that those are fixed. And we are, we're outsourcing that on trust to another open source project that may not be well resourced. Uh, the Pillow image framework, for instance, frequently has vulnerabilities. And do I have the expertise to go in and fix image software that's got buffer overruns in it? No, no I don't. And we don't. So... I think it goes beyond our individual choices and our individual missions and to recognize the things we rely on that are outside our purview and don't directly fall in this open infrastructure for scholarly communications, but a broader situation of open infrastructure projects that are mutually codependent, that have ongoing resourcing needs, that have ongoing security implications for one another, and that, that work together in that sense. You know, we've never spoken to anyone at, at Pillow Framework but we use it intensely and rely upon it. And they don't probably even know that, but we don't know who's maintaining that. That's a huge gap in our technical robustness. No, I think that's a great point. And I do, you know, I know we were talking about interoperability in a couple of different ways. I think one of the things that came out of the conversations over the past year in terms of also the additional pressure and, and strain on the system that we saw at sort of the various crises that were encountered was think conversations around interoperability, which are traditionally around various standards implementations, integrations, um, really shifting to also thinking about, okay, if we need to migrate off this system, or can we find ways of building resilience by integrating with other services that can provide a little bit more support. Um, and so I wanted to slightly kind of switch gears a little bit because I know Alec and Martin, you're both part of a project in terms of library publishing infrastructure, um, the Next Generation Library Publishing Project um, funded by the Arcadia Fund about assembling new solutions, which there's a report which I will link in the chat that was just released in March, kind of sharing out some of the design method and recommendations there. Um, and I wondered if, you know, I'll let you decide which one of you wants to speak a little bit more about it, um, but to speak a, about, you know, how that's kind of come together and, and where some of those core learnings are in terms of building connectors across a, a variety of various services and, and looking to unify and incentivize that collaboration. Well, I was going to pick on you otherwise. Okay. Project, <laughs> but um, I will speak about some of the things that really resonate with me in that work that we're, we're still in a very germinal phase. Um, but I will say that the best standards uh, lift us all up. 
And uh, just to pick one example, we do a lot of work with jets. And uh, I'm sure if we did less work with jets, I would have more hair. But um, it's just a great example of a standard that's written with the needs of the community in mind. And if we simply take two applications that kind of touch on the same set of requirements, put them next to each other and see where we can interconnect them, you end up with the least common denominator of the two applications. But if you look at the needs of the community and you analyze the content you're working with, then you end up with something like JATS. And I, I, I know not everyone's a huge JATS fanboy, fan person. I think it does really hold us to a much higher standard. And so what we're looking for is opportunities to bring together some of the stakeholders. And Martin mentioned, you know, projects that are out there that, uh, that they rely upon who don't even know that they uh, are a necessary dependency. I think it happens way too often in scholarship and in software where, you know, it's only two years into a, a major project that somebody says, hey, we're doing this crazy thing. And it's got a ton of overlap with, um, you know, things that we might, for example, already be working on. Um, so even just to assemble stakeholders into a room from more than just two specific technological perspectives, but include users and some of the big challenges like multilingualism and accessibility and so on. Just that as a premise for starting a project is a very strong premise. And so my hope is that we can continue some of the conversations that we're having already within that uh, project. Um, and it doesn't need to be anything super ambitious. I think even just having a common vocabulary is often a really important starting point. You know, what is an open review? Uh, if you ask that question, you're going to get 20 different responses and none of them is correct. Um, so just to assemble our respective experiences from different perspectives, bring them together and talk about some of those basic fundamental things like uh, vocabularies. That's, that's a very useful approach. Um, yeah, I'll pause there, I think. I mean, the hilarious thing about using JATS as an example of a good standard is that it took a working group, JATS for reuse, to work out how to standardize it in a way that everyone could get around. You know, this is this is another XKCD, uh, very well-known comic of, you know, we've got 13 standards. What we need is one more to unify them. Now we've got 14 standards. Um, so caution around some standardization. But I, I think I agree with Alec that what's productive about projects like NGLP is they're bringing us together to try to think about how we might bind our projects in some ways to certain interfaces that make them compatible that make them make them work together and sit alongside one another I mean so a really good example is to go back to what I was talking about at the beginning the the disincentives for export so everyone has a really strong incentive if they're if they're running a hosting platform or, or some kind of infrastructure as service to write the tools that will import things into their platform from other providers. Nobody in that economic situation has a really strong incentive to provide a common interface for export to ensure that people can get off their platform. We do that out of goodwill. And we do it because we know we're reliant on the other projects to do it so that we can import from them. But I wonder whether this is the start of a kind of conversation where we could just acknowledge that a bit more openly. And, you know, they, we're operating under constraints, but we commit that, OK, we, we, we will write a standard API between us with endpoints where you can get the lowest common denominator of data out of these platforms in a format that you can import into it. And, you know, and PKP do that already with OJS. We do that with Jane where we try to provide a standard export format. But I think that's that's what's interesting for me. I guess some of the caution I have around around those conversations and, and projects like this is that we don't want to lose what's good and specific about our own offerings. You know, there's a reason people choose a platform. And what we don't want to do is to strip away the identity of that in, in a quest for homogeneity, because what would be the point? We might as well just work on one project if, if we did that. These things all do slightly different things. And we have different design philosophies, different ideas for what we think the future will be. I mean, I mean, let me let me be brutally honest. The reason we don't use OJS because I just don't like PHP very much. That that's my that's the, the you know it's a silly reason in many ways, but it's why we started the project. We wanted to be able to change our platform radically. OJS has a very mature code base developed over a very long time, and to come into that as a, a newcomer and to hack away at it in a language that is not my not my home turf was not thing i really wanted to do so we made a technical decision well actually we could we could build something that does some different things in in a platform and language that we want to work in and that's that's fine you know healthy ecosystem and all that but it, it's 
you know, they now do different things. They have different functionalities, different goals for where we want to be. And I don't want to see interop as a way of flattening us down to just what both of them do as a bare minimum. Because I think we lose, we lose out if we do that. Thank you for that. Um, I also want to just say if folks have questions, please feel free to put those into the chat and we'll see how many of those we can address. I think wanting to go back to a question that Micah posted in the chat and Chris, I would love your um, love your thoughts on this too, because I know when it comes to interoperability, 2I2C already brings together a, you know, a number of key stakeholders in the community. I know you mentioned a number of them so far, like the Pangeo project and um, some of the other groups in the Jupiter ecosystem. Um, Mike had asked, have we reached or passed a point where technical resilience and open infrastructure is wholly dependent on community management over time, um, where people development is as much of the work as technical development? Chris, any thoughts? I mean, yeah, I have lots of thoughts. Um, I think that I, for me, I would argue that um, when people talk about like whether a project is is kind of open or sort of inclusive or not, um, I think that we've, at least in my opinion, we've moved beyond that definition being one of a license and we've moved more into community dynamics. So like, I care much more like, what is your governance? What are the routes for participation that you have for new people? Is governance controlled by a multi-stakeholder ecosystem or is it just a single entity kind of at the top of the pyramid? You know, I would argue that any open source project that has a single stakeholder ultimately controlling its governance is not actually an open project, but that's like, we can kind of get into conversations about that if, if we want. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that the question is shifting maybe towards like, what's the mode of production rather than what's the mode of distribution of software. And I think that that's really important because, you know, when you talk about things like interoperability, in my experience, the, the easiest way to define common standards that work with multiple different stakeholders is to have conversations early and often and have lots of high bandwidth connections between people that are using the tools for different things. I think this is why it's really important to have like neutral territories where this where a lot of the software is being developed, because it means that any one entity can't just like take it in their own direction and say like, you know, screw everybody else. Like you can either, it's my way or the highway, that kind of a thing. And I think that one of the things that it does is it forces conversation between stakeholders at a relatively early part of the process. Um, I mean, one example is, is in the Jupyter ecosystem, the IPI and B format has become a de facto standard for computational narratives across like a number of different domains. And while there are um, some sort of core Jupyter interfaces for these things, like the Jupyter Notebook, the classic interface like Jupyter Lab, um, there are also a lot of services that ingest notebooks as a core part of their workflow that depend on pieces of the Jupyter Notebook specification. And so whenever somebody wants to change something in the Jupyter Notebook format, it's not just like, oh, what's a feature we want in Jupyter Lab? It's like, okay, you gotta make sure that the Google collaboratory people and the like 17,000 startups that use Jupyter Notebooks and AWS Sage, you know, like all these different groups that, that depend on notebooks, they need to be a part of that conversation. Um, and I think that having Jupyter as a neutral organization with like true multi-stakeholder governance is a really crucial part of that. Um, maybe the, the one thing that I would tack on to that, though, is that there's a lot that needs to be improved in Jupyter's governance and in Jupyter's sort of dynamics around decision making and whatnot. And that's partially because Jupyter has grown in complexity quite a lot over the last like 10 years. Um, so it's not a Jupyter specific thing. But I think that to your point about like technical resilience via community dynamics, um, I think that there's a lot of like thinking that needs to go into sort of providing good frameworks for that kind of, you know, both like inclusive and efficient and productive participatory decision making across these kinds of things, because there are some examples of it. Um, there are also some anti patterns that are out there. And, and I think that that's something that will be really important for these like larger participatory groups to, to figure out in the future. Thank you for that. Um, I know that we've got a number of questions that are coming through and I'm also keeping an eye on time. So kind of shaking up some of the order here. Um, Chris Shillam from ORCID has asked uh, about the panelists view on to what extent they consider their work as part of a software development project versus being a service organization. 
I can quickly just note that on 2i2c side. I, I would argue that we kind of like very deeply intertwine those two things. Um, cloud services are often described as DevOps, right? It's development and operations. And generally speaking, the way that I think about it is that you want to do development in order to reduce your operational time. Like anytime something is breaking, you want to figure out how to develop it and automate it so that you don't have to touch it again in the future. Um, I think that what's what what we sort of like focus on on the development side is what I would call an upstream first mentality, which is as much as humanly possible, be responsible for as little code as you can, and instead commit upstream patches to other projects that you then customize and use as a part of your own services so that the development isn't developing your own code. It's developing a, a neutral like open source project that you're then just customizing and deploying for yourself. Um, so I think that the, the act of what we do is in many ways development, but the value of what 2i2c provides is actually in the service that it's providing people. So that's like, it's sort of a complicated non-answer to your question, but I feel like it's, it's at least in our case, it's not possible to like strictly separate those things from each other. Martin or Alec? Should I like it? Um, we started with software development as our aim. We wanted to build a platform and we, we didn't have a hosting option as part of that. Um, we originally subsidized our software development from the membership system at the publisher I run, and the software was developed specifically for that publisher via that economic model. As, as we built it, people asked us about it and wanted us to host it. I think that that's a core point that Alec made earlier, that our constituent demographics are not good at hosting their own solutions and don't want to have to become IT hosting providers. They want us to provide that for them. And so we saw that there was a way to build a revenue service that would, would help us to sustain the software development. So we got into that, that cycle. I think it helps us that that operation side, the hosting gives us a customer base for feedback um, and helps us to make that kind of distributed decision making that, that we were just talking about. I suppose one of the challenges we face, though, is that the landscape, well, any software project faces this challenge, but these, these projects are built on shifting social landscapes where what is required of them changes rapidly in response to policy announcements, just shifts in practice or long-standing debates. So for instance, the new focus on preprints and post-publication review radically changes the workflow that everyone had thought was embedded in scholarly publishing for half a century before that. Um, we've all built our software platforms over the last two decades to handle the conventional workflow and suddenly it changes and we don't know what those changes will look like going forward but having having a customer base for whom we run a hosting service at least gives us some feelers on the ground to be wired into those debates and to understand where i don't want to call them customers users are are thinking about what the future looks like so it, it's kind of future testing for us is it's how that feeds back into the software development side of what we do. Yeah, uh, I'll just echo a lot of what Martin had to say. Also, in terms of the balance between service organization and software organization, um, I came from software. I'm fully on board with the, the service view of PKP. I would say it's like two thirds service, one third software. And one thing that really shifted my thinking was uh, doing a number of workshops in parts of the world where you can't count on the kind of baseline infrastructure that we take for granted here. Um, and it's kind of a silly thing to talk about when you're inherently talking about web-based software, but uh, I did a workshop in uh, Nepal, for example, just to pick one of many examples. Um, and that experience of, of you know, uh, having older computers chained through a single extension cord that was literally smoking in the corner, trying to load software off of a single thumb drive, collecting viruses as you go around the room. Um, that's not a way in which anybody can be expected to come into the open source meritocracy view and be an equal participant. Um, and especially when the software is written in a way that prioritizes English, Latin languages, formal education, all of those things, um, we simply can't take the free and open source view that you can just start writing software and all of a sudden you're part of the, uh, the core uh, folks that, that maintain it without excluding all those folks. And I've worked on standards where you, know, you get 
you know, five or six of the major publishers around, they talk about a standard and before you know it, the standard is English based and using a technology that's inaccessible to most of the world. That happens all the time and we don't even think about it. So it depends on us to look at the service view of things and educate ourselves on what the rest of the world is doing as somebody who's, you know, white male in the Western world, formally educated, all that kind of stuff. We have to do better than just viewing ourselves as software projects. Thank you for that. So I know as a as sort of a closing question, I'd love to just hear just quick remarks from each of you about what's giving you hope going forth into this next in these next few months. Starting with Chris. Okay. Yeah, I guess we've sort of gotten into a repeating cycle of order here. Um, the so I mean for me, I think that I really appreciate the shift of at least what I perceive as a shift in the discourse, um, in particular in the kind of like data, like scientific analysis, open source space, which is what I'm most familiar with. I've definitely seen a shift in the last like six or seven years um, in the direction of the question that we had earlier of basically that like community dynamics and modes of production and um, and sort of governance and, and those kinds of things are really the, the new frontier of open source communities. Um, I think that alongside of that, I've also seen a lot of really amazing projects that have taken a very kind of like modular composable services approach to things. A good example of this is Joss, right? Like Joss has this notorious, you know, it costs us $2 to publish each article kind of thing. And while there's a lot of complexity that, you know, a traditional publisher deals with that Joss is not dealing with, I think it's pretty cool that they basically just cobbled together a bunch of pieces and put them together in a service that from a user standpoint feels like good enough in many ways. Um, and so I think that um, I think that being able to cobble things together in that sense requires having good modular composable projects that are out there. I think those kinds of projects will come into existence if you have like complicated, diverse, multi-stakeholder communities behind them. And I think that you can only you can only make those communities succeed if you put a lot of thought and energy into community dynamics and governance and, and things like that. And so to me, like, I wanna see more things like Joss. And I think that for that to succeed, I, you need more things that are composable and modular. And I think that for that to happen, people are thinking in the right direction around like community governance and participation and inclusion and whatnot. And so that, that gives me hope that at least we're sort of like, trending the things that we care about in the right direction rather than just arguing about like i don't know agpl versus sspl and stuff like that i think that i think that's like the direction that that will lead to a, a good outcome and i'm i'm hopeful that we can kind of keep pushing that forward thank you for that martin or alec okay i'll go um so I'm going to back away from our software development, from my hope and our, our infrastructure and talk about what it's enabling and what's changing with our target demographic audiences for, for whom we write this software. Over the last decade and a half, I've seen open access for scholarly publication take hold and meet less and less resistance in many quarters. A large part of that is due to PKP's OJS and its widespread use. Um, I've seen many individuals take our software projects and use them to try to create a better publishing ecology just off their own bat. Did that every, every time I see someone who wants to do that, you know, I might advise them against it and say it will take the rest of your life if you do this. But it gives me hope that people care enough and we're giving them tools that will let them start to think in a utopian way you know to start to think there's a better way of doing this and here's the tool that might help me to do it so that gives me hope and finally over the last seven years i've demonstrated new economic models for ongoing sustainability of publishing enterprises that are open access and open source um, the membership model we have at olh was the first of a, a contemporary journal publishing ecosystem to use that membership model in which libraries participate without any direct rivalrous benefit at their end, but because it's good for the infrastructure and the ecosystem as a whole. And when we get that kind of participation that isn't solely bound by market classical economics, 
we do a lot more with the money and the collaboration means essentially we have a lot more resources and we're not competing directly with the Elseviers to whom Alec gestured earlier because we work on a different ethical plane of support that aligns with the values of the communities who are financially supporting us. And I think all of my hopes are centered around that, that notion of values aligning with what we're developing and feeling that, yes, this fits. What we're doing is driven by values and the people we're serving have the same values and the software works for them. That was really beautiful. I think I'm gonna take note of that, working on a different ethical plane of support and kind of chew on that for a little longer. Alec, over to you. I hope you don't expect me to wrap that up because that was, that was really good. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't have a crystal ball for all of this. Um, I think we're gonna see a lot of interesting aftermath of um, COVID, for example, a uh, budgetary aftermath. And a lot of what we're doing right now is discussing based on the pre-COVID status quo and then the, in depending on where you're living in the world, either the uh, sudden inrush of borrowed money or the paucity of borrowed money. And I'm seeing a lot of potential for some inequalities to emerge from that, which I'm concerned about, but haven't materialized yet. Um, it's been fun to see preprints all of a sudden get uh, better understood by the public at large or, or fully better understood. That's been fun to watch. Um, I'm, I'm in a few conversations, and this is one about the need to fund maintenance and hard costs around difficult things. And again, I'll give another mention to accessibility. Um, and every time we talk about that and prioritizing interoperability and so on, it gets us a bit further. This conversation here today got us a little bit further on that. And uh, so anything we can do on that will be positive. Um, those are hard work. Uh, scholarly communication is a rich, multicultural, long history, transitional thing. And uh, interoperability is hard and we don't have to do either perfectly. Um, the only perfect interoperability is theoretical uh, interoperability, which is why sometimes it's really easy to apply for grants to come up with new interoperability. And it's really hard to uh, sustain or, or further perfect uh, existing interoperability. And so in some ways it's frustrating to see from a, a, an established and uh, long storied software application um, discussions of interoperability come up that are divorced from the need to like make it real, make it happen. Um, and so if we do that work and we do it badly or we do it partially, that's at least a step forward. And we always try to chisel tough problems from, let's say the, the idea of the economic model that's a disincentive to communication between two systems. You can always identify pieces of that that you have a positive um, uh, incentive to do. So for example, transferring a rejected submission and a peer review from submission system A to submission system B. That's not at odds with the economic model, but it is a piece towards allowing people to have full control over their content in a way that would uh, further um, interoperability. Likewise, having a shared common content model, if that would be Jets for R, then that's one thing, but having that shared model or at least discussing some of the vocabularies underlying it, that's an inherent piece towards that interoperability. But I think the biggest thing that I've noticed is uh, in this last year, um, we've invested a lot of time and effort in the distributed nature of our software, the folks that host it all over the world in different languages and so on. And that's an environment in which the pandemic has come in and tested the resiliency of a lot of projects. And those investments that are often very difficult and very time consuming in making a distributed project, they've, they've borne fruit in the pandemic because you already have some of those distributed strengths uh, in people managing their own tools, taking ownership of them. Um, and it's again, it's not perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect, but just the resiliency that's been shown in those investments has been really inspiring to, to me and has helped to you know, justify all the directions that we've gone in the last 15 years. Thank you. Can Chris. I quickly note one other thing? Sure. Sorry, I just it, I, it really, I realize that there's like something else that, that I'm excited about that I think is, um, is, is something that suggests that the world will be better in this in these directions anyway in the future. And that is that I do think that the bar is getting lowered to experimentation. Um, I think that like there are more modular tools, there are more composable tools, there are more standards out there. Cloud infrastructure makes it possible to do things that wouldn't have been possible before. And in, in a lot of these conversations, especially with like scholarly communities that have been around for like 70 years and, and stuff like that, I think there's always kind of a tension about like, when you say community, who do you mean? When you say a community of users, who do you mean? Because for example, whenever I talk to people about scholarly communications, JATS, the format always comes up. But like individual scientists, researchers, scholars, they don't 
many of them don't even know what JATS is, right? Like JATS is a thing for journals. It's not a thing for a, a researcher. Um, it serves researchers, but they don't think about it. They don't know what it is and, and that kind of thing. And I think that for that reason, it's important to think about like gearing a particular tool towards that particular community and having a kind of user-driven uh, focus to it. And I think that as these tools become more modular and accessible, the gap between, for example, those two groups might uh, shrink a bit. And I think that, for example, when you have random researchers uh, who can experiment enough to start building their own things, then you're, you're driving more of the development from the perspective of the, the sort of like end user who's actually using it. And I think that that's a good thing. Um, I think that it'll like break us out of like old patterns of thinking and old assumptions and old constraints uh, because there are different kinds of people participating in this space than, than we're able to like 10 or 20 or 50 years ago. No, thank you for that. And I know this conversation could go on for quite some time, and I'm very grateful for everyone's time and for sticking with us till the end. Um, we've just got a few minutes left, so I just want to take a moment to thank Alec, Martin, and Chris for joining us and, and participating in this discussion, sharing their viewpoints and their work. Um, on our end, we will be sharing out this uh, recording on our blog. So for those that are unable to attend or want to tune in afterwards, they have an opportunity to do so. Um, over the next few months, we'll be having um, some more discussions like these with community members like yourselves uh, around topics such as technology oversight and accountability. How can we ensure that we are furthering transparency and accountability, ensuring um, equitable, affordable, and reliable access to research and knowledge is baked into our systems and our decisions when it comes to infrastructure. Um, also around staffing, around maintenance, some of the issues that we've seen come up through around that and more conversations about funding and sustainability. So please stay tuned for those. We'll be having more updates to come and our thanks again. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you, cheers. Bye.